Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of my tabletop simulator series. I hope you had some fun with the tutorial because in this video, we're gonna keep building on those skills and make them even better. All right, so to do that, I created a little exercise room that you can use to get used to the things that you're going to need a lot when you're working with Tabletop Simulator. So to get in there, we're going to create um, that exercise room. So click on Create, click on Single Player, and we're looking here for Dr. Bob's Tabletop Simulator exercise tutorial, how to play games. So load that up, and if you can't find that in your list, check out the previous video because I explained in more detail where you would find that on the workshop. So click on load and you should see this room, which just contains a whole bunch of note cards and some game components. Now, I hope from the tutorial, you'll still remember how to use your camera. It's done with the right mouse button and to use WASD to move around. Now, personally, I find WASD to move around in tabletop simulator, not that useful. Instead, I am just panning my camera by pressing down the middle mouse button. And when you press middle mouse and you move, you'll see it'll just move like this, which I find very, convenient and it allows me to kind of play tabletop simulator with minimal key presses, which is nice. All right. So what else do you need to know to do this tutorial? Well, um, you need to know how to zoom in on those cards because else you're just going to have to do this all the time and it will take forever. So an easier way to zoom at pretty much anything in tabletop simulator is to press the alt button on your keyboard while your mouse is hovering over it. So I'll do that for this note card. And as you see, it will just zoom in the image and you'll get a pretty clear view of what's written on the card. It works for anything. You can do it for a die. You can do it for a playing card, for a poker chip, whatever you want. Alternatively, you can also use the M button. M stands for magnifying, and it'll give you this cute little magnifying glass that you can pretend to be a detective with, and you can zoom in with the mouse wheel as well. So there's two methods to zoom in. I recommend the Alt method for this specific room. All right, let's move on to exercise number one then. So exercise number one is sitting down at a color. So we want you to click on your name in the top right corner and change the color to see what happens. So that works like this. You just click on it, click on change color, and you'll get these colorful dots around the table and two dots in the middle. What are they for? Well, they determine where you are sit seated around the table. So say I want to be the purple player. I just click on it and now I am sitting here at the table. It doesn't change the gameplay that much. It just changes your perspective a little bit, but it has some implications because now you are the purple player. So you have the purple hand and a whole lot of things will change in Tabletop Simulator, but we'll see that later on. The other two colors that you really need to know about are the black one and the gray one. The gray one makes you a spectator. That means you can't see any hidden information. So you can't see into other players' hands or in any hidden zones, which I'll explain later. Um, but you can still see the game as it unfolds, as you would as if you were a spectator to, say, a competitive card game or something. Then there is the black player. The black player is not actually a player. It's more like a game master. And the game master knows and sees everything. So don't mess with the game master. They can be very mean and they can kick you out of the room and all that kind of stuff as well. So don't be a game master if you're playing the game because that gives you access to everything and people will probably consider it cheating. All right, so for this tutorial, just go sit back on the white spot and that's pretty much the end of the first exercise. So let's move on to the next one. All right, so for the second exercise, we are going to pick up a card, flip it, put it on a deck, take it back off, flip it again, drop it, and then swap the deck and the card out. So, okay, well, there's a deck and a card here, so let's see what that's all about. So first, to pick it up, all you have to do is click it uh, with your left mouse button, and then you can move it around. Um, you can flip it with the F button, and this is all stuff from the tutorial, so you might already know this, but I'm just repeating it to make sure it sticks. Um, and then you can put it on the deck. So if you put it to the side of the deck, it won't stack properly. You have to make sure you put it on the top and then it'll stack nicely and it should look like this. One way to see if it's stacked nicely actually is by hovering over the deck because you'll see the number of cards that's in the deck. For now it's 51 because there's one card here, but when I put that on the deck properly, it'll say 52. Anyways, to get the card back off the deck, you have to left click it and immediately drag to the side. So that looks like this, and that allows you to take one card off. So to continue the exercise, I'm gonna flip it, I'm gonna drop it, and now we have to swap them out. So to do that, first I'm gonna make some space for the deck, like so, and then I'm gonna click on the deck and hold my left, button, my left mouse button down. Um, this allows me to move the deck in the same way as if I was moving a card around. So I'm just gonna put it to the side now, 
let go of the left mouse button to drop it and then do the same with the card. And that's pretty much exercise two. Now, it does say that I want you to repeat this until comfortable because if you're going to make games in Tabletop Simulator or if you're gonna go play with strangers online, you need to have this down because you're gonna have to do this a ton of times. And if you mess up and you know, you're know you supposed to just take one card of a deck, but you take the entire deck, some really weird things can happen with a Tabletop Simulator. Nothing that would really ruin the game, but it will just eat up a lot of time and it's not very efficient. So. Practice it a little bit if you need to. All right, so exercise three pertains to picking up multiple objects. So the idea is that you pick up not one card, but two cards, three cards, four cards, and so forth from a stack. Now a stack is not necessarily a deck of cards. It could also just be a stack of poker chips or a stack of tiles. Any kind of game component that is listed as stackable in the game engine will turn into a stack if you put them on top of each other. So to pick up one card of a stack, it's what we just explained. You left mouse click it and drag immediately, like I did with the card here. But if you then hover with that single card over the stack, you can right mouse click and pick up more cards. So here I'm taking, I probably already have like six of them, I think. Yeah, six cards and I can do it again. Let's take three more, put them on top of the six and now I have nine cards. So this is a very quick way to take multiple cards and you want your games to be quick and efficient because it's more fun that way. Um, this applies to any stackable object as I was talking about earlier. So you can also do it with the poker chips, just drag to the left really quickly when you click it. And then you can ride mouse to pick up more poker chips. And even so you can, um, hover it above the cards and also right mouse click and pick up some cards as well. It doesn't even have to be dead deck. You can do it everywhere. You can even pick up the note card um, if you really want to be adventurous. So yeah, I think, yep, that does exercise three. Let's move on to the next one. So, all right. In this exercise, we're going to do shuffling, drawing and dealing. Important thing that you want to play any card game. So to do this, you hover over the deck and you press the R button and you'll get this little animation. Now that makes it shuffle the deck. Now, of course, shuffling starts with an S and you're pressing R. So the way to memorize this is the R stands for randomize. And it works with anything in the game that you can randomize, whether it's cards or it's dice or anything else that you could randomize. So you just press R to shuffle. Um, and that's basically step two. So then we're going to look at how do you do drawing. Now to draw, you obviously need to know where your hand is first in the game. So the hand of cards that you're physically holding as if you were playing an actual card game. So the hand of cards that you have in Tabletop Simulator will be on your name tag that is attached to the table. So in this case, since I'm the white player, right here is where um, my hand of cards would be. So if I would take a single card off that deck and put it in here, it'll be assigned to my hand, which means that people, uh, that the other players can only see the back of that card. They can't see what card that actually is. It will also appear at the bottom of my user interface. Um, and if I hover over it, it will slide out a little bit. And if I press the F button, I can see what card that it is. Whenever I flip the card in my hand though, I am the only person who can see it. Again, other players can't see in your hand. They can only see that there are cards there, but they can't see what cards are there. All right. So that's how um, a hand works. Um, so I'm going to take that card back off. Now for the exercise, and I'm going to click on this with Alt. I'm going to draw one card to my hand by pressing the one button. Now, whenever I refer to pressing a number in this tutorial, I want you to know that it's always going to be the number that's above the letters on your keyboard. If you have a numeric keyboard to the side of uh, your keyboard, don't use those because it won't work. You need to have the, 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 the number buttons that are above the letters. So if I press that button briefly on one, it'll draw one card. If I pick another number, for example, if I press the three button briefly, it'll send me three cards. If I press four, five, six, it's just gonna send you that number of cards. Now, be careful with it, because on my computer, if I press too long, it will repeat the action before I actually see the cards get sent to me. So I might just give myself the entire deck before I know it. So just press the, the button really lightly and wait until the animation has completed and you'll be fine. Okay, so the next way to draw cards um, is to right click, and then you'll see that there is an option to draw cards in that menu. There's also an option to shuffle the cards in that menu, um, which we were doing with the R button so far. Um, so those are other ways for you to shuffle and draw. But the final way to do it is using the deal function. Now, dealing means that you're gonna send a card to another player at the table. And to do so, you use their color code. So 
Earlier in this video, I was the, the purple player in a short amount of time. So if I would want to send a card to the player that owns the purple hand, all I have to do is press that button. And as you'll see here in the tutorial, a card has moved to this area. There's no name there because there's no player there, but it will still send the cards there because I pressed that button. You can also see that I have no idea what this card is. It just shows me some question marks. I know that there's a card in that player's hand, but I don't know what card it is. However, if I were to deal to the white player, that's to myself, you'll see that the cards pop up in the interface and they also pop up at the bottom of the screen. And yeah, that pretty much concludes uh, this exercise. The only step that I haven't discussed is how you return the cards in your hand. For now, you can just drag them from here onto the deck and you'll be fine. Also, if you wanna um, hide that little deck in the interface, you just press the H button and it'll disappear. Press the H button again to bring it back up. It can be convenient if it's um, covering some parts of your screen. So next up, exercise five is about duplicating items. Because one of the perks of making a board game or a paper prototype in a video game engine is that you can copy paste and just conjure things up out of uh, thin air. So we're gonna learn how to do that in this exercise. So first off, we're gonna drag a selection box surrounding the dice, and then we're gonna press Ctrl and C on our keyboard to make a copy, and then Ctrl and V the paste. And as you can see, I now made a copy of these six dice. Alternatively, you could also use the, the right menu, uh, the right mouse menu and use copy and paste down here. But I prefer using the keyboard for this type of thing. So we now have the double amount of dice. So what we're going to do now is we're going to see if the shuffling works here as well. So we're going to select all of them and then press the R button for shuffle. And as you can see, you get this really cool animation <laughs> of the dice. Now, another cool feature of Tabletop Simulator is if you hover over a selection, it'll give you additional information. So in this case, it will actually tell me that all the dice that I rolled, which are 12 dice, um, they amount together to 54, which is very quick and very convenient. All right, moving on. So exercise six is about grouping and searching. So the idea here is that we are going to group these cards together and build a deck that only contains uh, queens. And then we're going to put the six in there. I'm going to try to relocate the six after we've shuffled that deck. So to do so, we're going to select all the queen cards and we're going to press the G button, which stands for group. And that will turn it into a deck. Um, we're going to flip that deck and we're going to bring it over here. By now, you should be able to do this. If not, practice it a little bit more. And then we're going to copy paste the deck, I think, five times or four times. Um, yeah, that's about right going to select all the decks and press G again because that also works. And now we have a single deck of 20 cards and we're going to grab our six card, flip it, put it on top and we're going to shuffle it by pressing R. So this deck is shuffled pretty well and I should not have a six on top of it now. Yep. <laughs> I should not second, probably not. I mean, there's a small chance, obviously, that I'm going to grab the six. So the six was the fourth card. Okay. So let's put them back. And I'm going to shuffle it one more time. So I have no idea where it is. Now, say I would want to find that six card and, you know, it might be the 20th card. So that would take forever using the method that I just showed you. Another way to do it is to right click it and select search. And as you can see now, I can see everything that's in there. And there's a little magnifying glass showing that somebody is searching that deck. So never use this for cheating purposes either. Um, you can just click on a card in there, drag it out. And if I flip this one, it's actually the six. So that is how you can easily readjust the deck once you've shuffled it. All right. Moving on to exercise seven, where we are going to look at locking cards. This is actually a very important feature. So when you hover over the card, you always see this little highlight. So we're going to highlight the card and we're going to press L to lock it. And you'll see that that highlight immediately disappears. So if I try to click it now and drag it, I promise this usually works, but it doesn't work now because I've locked it. It is stuck to the table now. So I can no longer pick it up until I put my mouse cursor over it and I press L to lock it again. Or sorry, to unlock it. So now I can pick it up again. Just try it out for yourself. An alternate way to do this is in the right mouse menu. You can go to toggles and go to lock and that works in the same manner. And you don't have to use the right mouse menu to unlock it again. Like you can just use L. So that's how locking cards work. Um, the next exercise actually expands a little bit on that as well. So now we're going to draw on objects. So I want you to lock this, the card on the right, make sure it's locked 
um, and that the left one is not locked. And now I want you to use the pen tool. So there's all these tools to the side. I'm not going to explain all of them because you don't need all of them to play games. But we're going to look at the pen tool and um, it is found under the draw section. Uh, the first icon is pen. Um, these are also F1, F2, F3 and so forth on your keyboard as shortcuts. Um, and with the pen tool, you can actually draw. So let's draw um, uh, the letter B on the card to the right. You can actually draw whatever you like. Now you'll see that I'm drawing a white B on that card. Actually, let's change that color to something else, maybe purple. And let's do it again so it's a little bit easier to see for you guys. So I'm drawing a B here. All right, so that worked pretty well. Let's try to do the same thing on the card to the left. I am clicking and I am drawing, but I'm sure you can see this doesn't look like it's actually working. So what is going on here? Well, let's unlock the card to the right and let's move both of them out of the way. No surprises here, but on the left card, you'll see that I was actually drawing on the table. So the moral of the story here is whenever you're drawing, it draws to whatever locked object is underneath your pen. So that's actually way more important than you might think right now, because this allows you to draw on cards, on assets, on anything in the game. So if you're quickly prototyping a game for class or something, and you want to just get stuff out of the way and really quickly make something, you can just grab a random deck of cards and, and say, draw a five on it. And now this card has strength five or something for, I don't know, a battle game. So this is a very useful feature that is often overlooked. So make sure you know how this works. All right, moving on, states and colors. So right click on the chess piece and see what happens if you change the state. So I changed it to state two and it became a horse. Um, I changed it to state, what is it, five? Oop, I'm misclicking here. Five and it turns into, um, I think that's the queen. So you can change the chess piece by changing its state. Also, you can use the numeric keys above your letters again to change the state a little bit quicker. Like if I press one, it's a pawn, two, a horse, three. And this way you can just start swapping it really rapidly. Um, so with states, some objects can be set that they have different states and it makes it easy to change things out. A lot of games will have the manual in the game and to um, go through the manual from page to page, you're just gonna have to change the state because every page is a different state number. So that's how you change states, but there's other stuff you can do with that right men uh, mouse menu. For example, color tint. If you click on color tint and select the color, let's go with teal because teal is awesome. We will turn the color of the chess piece into teal. So this is an easy way for you to make pieces that correspond to a certain player color. This stuff also works to other objects. For example, a die. Now a die doesn't have any states, but it has a rotation value, which kind of corresponds to a state. So if you want uh, the four to face up, you can just set the rotation uh, value to that and it'll go to the top. Similarly, you can just press the numbers on your keyboard to swap out whatever this has to be. This can be very convenient for some games as well. I know of games that actually use dice just to store a certain value instead of getting a random number. Um, the color tint also works for dice. If you set it to a different color, the dice color will change. And um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, exercise nine. I'm gonna add a little thing here to the exercise that I didn't put on the card. I'll put it in the cards later. But if you press the plus and the minus button on your keyboard, you can magnify um, or minimize the size of the objects as well, which can be very convenient. Anyway, a little tip for everybody who is still watching the video at this point. <laughs> so exercise 10 then, hidden zones. Hidden zones are really cool to have hidden information in your game. And it also works with one of the tools like the pen. So you wanna either press F3 or click this button here and then select the hidden zones. Now a hidden zone lets you draw on the table and draw a cube in a certain color. So let's do that over the area that I marked as one. And you can see that I now have this cube on here um, that's kind of translucent and um, yeah, it's a cube. Now, if I click that with my left mouse, it'll disappear. It'll no longer be there and I can drag it again. And if I click it with my right mouse, it'll allow me to change out the color of the cube. So say I want this cube to belong to the red player, I can set it to red. I'll show you in a second why you would wanna do that. First, we're gonna also draw a cube here and we're just gonna leave this cube or actually we're gonna set that to the white so that you can see that this is actually a cube belonging to the white player, not the gray player, even though it looks kind of grayish. All right, so how do these cubes work? Well, um, whatever is in the cube is only visible to the player of the color of the cube. So if I would move my six here into 
the white zone and I let go of it because letting go is important, <laughs> you'll, um, you'll see that I can still see the card and nothing really happened. But if I move the same card to the red zone, as long as I'm holding it, it's fine. But when I let go, it'll disappear because now it is only visible to the red player, well, and the game master if there's a black player at the board. If you want to remove these hidden zones, you have to be the game master or you have to be at least promoted to have control over the room. You can just click them, they'll disappear and whatever was in there will still be there. So this is how you can have hidden information from each other and in any kind of game um, in which you might have a certain amount of objects that nobody else can see, sometimes Tabletop Simulator will have some instructions that require you to draw hidden zones. So this is how you do that. All right, so then we get to exercise 11 and the last uh, four exercises are all pretty quick actually. So this one is about whispering. If you wanna send some hidden information to somebody, you click on the text bubble here, you go to game and you get this little text field. And if you type in hi, it'll broadcast it to everybody. If you type in backslash and then, oops, I accidentally pressed the question mark, which gives a handy help window. But if you press the backslash um, and you, type the color of a player, for example, white, which is me, you will only send that message to the player of that color. So if I say hello to white, it will only be sent to me. And you can see here that it goes from you to white. If you type another color, let's say I go with orange, aloha, it will tell me, well, nobody's playing as orange or your, your message hasn't been sent. But if there were to be an orange player, only the orange player would see that. So this is convenient to tell people things if you want to tell it in private and it's basically whispering. Exercise 12 is also about hidden information because it involves the blindfold. To put on a blindfold, you can uh, right click anywhere on the table. As long as you're not clicking on an object, it's fine. And then you can select blindfold and you'll see this blindfold in your player color appear and you can click it to remove it again. An alternative way to do it is pressing the B button, which I find a little bit more convenient. If you have a blindfold on, everybody at the table will know. So if you tell them I have the blindfold on, but you don't, people will know you're a dirty cheater. Anyways, um, the second part of the exercise is pressing the P button. And the P button um, actually changes the camera mode. So if you press it once, you'll be in first person camera. And if you do that, you'll notice that now the controls are slightly different. W has you zoom in, S has you zoom uh, out and there are a lot of uh, subtle differences. If you move, want to move the camera up and down, it's control and space. I don't know the first person mode that well because I like the third person mode better, but maybe you like this one better. So if that's the case, you can use P to set the camera mode to first person. If you press P again, you'll get a message that now the top down camera has been activated. Top down kind of turns tabletop simulator into a 2D experience, which can be very convenient if you struggle with 3D environments. So now everything is completely flat and it's really easy to position assets in the room. So if you're making games, sometimes this is actually a really handy view. I still prefer the third person view, but sometimes I switch to um, top down perspective because it's just so handy. Anyways, if I press P again, I'll be back in my third person mode and everything will be the way it was before I started pressing P. If at any point it feels like the camera gets weird or the controls aren't what you're expecting, try pressing the P button because you might be in a different perspective mode. You can also um, click on the right mouse button and uh, just on the table, as long as it's not on an object, you're fine and you'll find camera mode and you can set it manually that way. You can also save cameras uh, spots and load camera spots, which can be convenient. Anyways, um, so moving on to exercise 13, we're gonna look into ping and lines. So what does that mean? Well, pinging is a technique that you use when you wanna draw somebody's attention to anything on the table. So it basically entails that you press the tab button and you'll see this little arrow pop up wherever you're pointing with your mouse. So say you wanna tell a person um, that you're playing with, look at this die. You can just hover over the die, press tab and a little arrow will appear. So it's really convenient for people to see what you're actually talking about. There's multiple assets with the same name on the table. You can also click and drag while holding tab and then you'll get a line. Um, and with that line, you can actually calculate the distance between two objects if that would be useful for some sin. Uh, there's lots of war games and like Warhammer that require you to actually measure the distance between different characters. So if you're doing something like that, this might be useful. But most of the time, I find that the line is being used for people to point out the relationship between two assets. Say if you want to tell somebody, hey, take that die over here and bring it over there. 
then you draw a line. So that is pinging and lines, and that is pretty much exercise 13. And then we get to exercise 14, the undo button. So read this entire card before you complete it, um, because undoing is basically resetting to what just had happened. It's like undoing in Photoshop or in Microsoft Word or in any other kind of software. So say if I were to click this button that says flip, it will just toss the table around if you get really angry. That's a good way to alleviate some steam, I guess. Um, but it also ruins the game for everyone. So if you want to fix this again and go back to where the table was, you can just press Ctrl and Z and just give it a second and everything will be back to normal. Um, you can also use the rewind time and the fast forward time button in the menu here, which will pretty much do the same thing. And um, yeah, if I press it one more time, I think it would even, no, it doesn't go back to flips, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, so you can use these buttons to go through the states as well. So if you're playing a game and something goes horribly wrong, somebody deletes an important deck or you drop a card and it falls off the table and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? just rewind time with Ctrl Z and you'll probably be fine. Um, just be careful, there is some delay on it because it has to reset the entire state. So just give it a second to do it and you'll be fine. Um, if you do it with other people on a server, always tell them as a host that you are going to do this before you do it because else stuff can get really messed up. So always make sure that people know that um, an undo is coming up. And that is the end of the tutorial. Um, I hope this is a way for you to get better at tabletop simulator quicker and that it gives you everything you need to know to play the game. Um, honestly, I can't come up with anything else that I think you might need, but if you do, feel free to reach out to me and I'll update the tutorial. At this point, I think it would be a good idea for you guys to just go to the games area here, to the workshop. Um, obviously, I already have a lot of games in there, but if you don't, click on browse and go find yourself a game and go play it with some of your team members of this class online or maybe join a game with strangers. Who knows? There's a lot of fun to be had on Tabletop Simulator. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.